uh, welcome and hello everyone uh, for the first time or welcome back this is part 29 of libraries and recovery what we're calling now libraries and recover recovery what we were calling earlier libraries in response what we we're calling even earlier that well, wtf libraries uh, and what was happening this we started in late march uh, with the question, what is a library if the building is closed? That became kind of an obvious existential question uh, when for the last 10, 15 years, we've been talking about libraries as a place, as a third place uh, full of spaces, maker spaces, meeting spaces, and so on. Uh, since the arrival of, uh, of uh, ebooks, especially, uh, the, the another condition triggering and accelerating transformation of libraries uh, started happening and the space function uh, became uh, a higher order of service. But then with the building closed, well, okay, now what are we? Uh, <clears throat> there was a little bit of curbside service going on in some places. Some libraries were able to remain open, but generally they were all closed. So what did that lead? So we were exploring these aspects of that question with uh, internet access, digital services, physical materials, and uh, social infrastructure, the role that the libraries play in their communities on a, on a whole number of levels. And so we proceeded through most every week since then, uh, looking at this question and having a whole host of, of extraordinary speakers, uh, which we have again today, two or three extraordinary speakers talking to us about uh, research and education networks uh, as critical connectivity partners. Uh, anchor institutions, libraries being one, our favorite anchor institution, uh, have a, an array of uh, network providers uh, in the US. The, the RE networks, uh, I think, supply connectivity to over a quarter of a million anchor institutions. I'm not current on that statistic. Maybe uh, we can get an update there, but that's, that's a lot uh, and by any definition. And the, we'll, I won't step into the service level and why that's important, but uh, it is important. And we're going to hear about that as well as what's behind the RENs. Um, I've borrowed this image from, from XKCD, uh, which just I thought kind of fits what we're talking about today. Um, it, it, it was a basically open to talking about the Internet Archive, but uh, the, this question about, you know, how many systems we depend on and don't have a clue about how they work, uh, I thought appropriate for our, our conversation today. Uh, we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. We're an open collaboration of tech using innovation libraries uh, and have focused for the last few years on wireless extensions, uh, how libraries can use wireless technology to extend access beyond the walls. Uh, we began with uh, the fiber to the library campaign in 2007 saying that the, the most expedient, most economical and equitable way to deliver next generation broadband in every community is to run gigabit fiber to every library, all 17 something thousand libraries. And not only would that provide us a high performance service to a priority endpoint where roughly one in three adults access the internet at a library. I mean, it's a stunning number, 80 million people. And those are like 14 and over. Uh, but it also would uh, drive the infrastructure deeper into these communities or markets, if you will. And if done properly uh, as open or shared middle mile could then uh, allow interconnect uh, for last mile providers, public, private, wired, wireless. And that led to us joining and co-founding the Schools, Health and Libraries Broadband Coalition, a Washington DC based advocacy group that presses for uh, greater broadband gigabit capability to uh, anchor institutions all over the country. So it, it, it's been quite a ride and uh, we have joined with the uh, with IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, uh, to produce this series. IFLA has been a partner with ours in an advocacy around public access. Uh, we think that 
public access should be the baseline service for everyone. Everyone should be nearby to some sort of a public resource, public access resource, like a library or a community center or something like that for no fee or very low fee access. And ideally, because of what libraries do, provide support and training to, uh, to new users. So you can see that project at uh, the Partnership for Public Access, p4pa.net, number four. Uh, dot net, and you'll see a 2020 declaration calling for uh, uh, for advancing that. So let's uh, uh, let's get to the context. Uh, the pandemic was a triggering crisis, but we've had a cascade of crises this year. Not that they were all just happening this year, but that's the dominant one. Uh, this is two weeks ago. Uh, a stunning acceleration of cases in the U.S. Uh, 121,000. I mean, when we were started tracking these, it was like we were, we were getting blown away. It was 60,000 cases a day. And then a week later, you know, another million people and 163,000 and, and the rates are climbing. And this was, this was today, this was this morning's case, you know, uh, uh it, it's, it's out of control. And, uh, so, uh, we're back in, uh, close to a lockdown situation, even as we know a lot more about this virus and we have the good news of, of uh, vaccines on the horizon, uh, the proofs are very encouraging, but you know, they're not here now and people are getting sick and the hospitals are filling up. So uh, we need to be cautious about that and, and how we operate. Uh, not the only crisis facing us, uh, the, the greater, the granddaddy crisis of, of climate change surrounds us, the storms and fires and the rest of it we've talked about. The context here is libraries in response, libraries as second responders, we would call them to these various kinds of crises uh, as natural shelters, or if they're, if they're engineered correctly with robust and resilient communications capability that could resist an uh, outage of of uh, electricity or even the internet, where people will go to a library even without having been told to do it. They'll just figure it out when something happens. Uh, and in this connectivity, I'm use, we're using some global uh, symbols here. Uh, we have a, a new entry into the connectivity game here. This is the Starlink map. Um, it seems phenomenal that this could actually work, but you know, who would say that Elon can't do something uh, but we'll see, uh, even if it works, this will still be Starlink's data running through their servers for whatever that represents. So today, let's get to it. Uh, part 29, uh, we're going to look at the, the roles of uh, these research and education networks having grown out of the, uh, the actual, I would say, the first generation of the internet were built uh, by the universities, or rather by these uh, entities that the universities uh, set up in collaboration to allow them to share, uh, driven originally by uh, the desire to connect to supercomputer centers. And so those national networks have grown, of course, and, and uh, the, the research education networks product, providing services to other educational institutions and other anchor institutions. So that's a, a really amazing story. And uh, we're going to start off with uh, uh, Jim Stewart and uh, Corey uh, uh, as well, Corey Stokes from uh, UETN, the Utah Education and Telehealth Network, one of the leading RINs in the US. And they're gonna talk about their various services, their exploration into wireless, we hope, talk a little bit about that. And then also what they see as kind of the future of the services and the roles of RINs uh, or their RIN anyway. And then we'll uh, come to Catherine uh, at uh, uh, Giant. Giant, did I say that right, Catherine? Okay, well, here we go, Jim, uh, take it away. Let me stop share here. Okay. Don, thank you very much. And uh, one other colleague we have with us today is Jeff Egley, who uh, works very closely with this project and also is our, our, pro our product manager for the EdgeRome project that we have going here. And, and I'll be talking a little bit about that uh, but um, if we could uh, go ahead, uh, Corey, are you, is this you sharing then? So um, 
We have we are a REN with 1,700 different locations serving uh, higher education, uh, public education, libraries, and um, telehealth, and and some others. And so this becomes something that. Um, and, and let me before I, I get started on that, just let me say that I have over 20 years at the Utah Education and Telehealth Network, and uh, my one of my very first projects when I came in was the state library called me and asked uh, if I could help them with a filtering project. And we've been tracking libraries ever since. They're a very important part of our mission. And up until recently, we've not received any funding for them directly, even though they've always been a part of our mission. And, and we have our state librarian, um, Colleen Eggett, sit on our board. And so uh, we, we are very happy to be part of this. And Corey's Dad, who I know well, uh, lives uh, close by where I live, uh, was a professional librarian and, and uh, part of the library system for many, many years also. So we have very close ties to libraries and we're, we're glad to be here and be a part of this. Uh, one of the things that really is important to us in those 1700 sites is access. And it's great to have fiber everywhere, but unless you can access those networks and, and unless the millions of people that we serve in our state have access to those networks. Doesn't matter how many uh, fiber connections we have out. And certainly this was pointed out to us in the pandemic. And so today as we present, we want to bring up our website. And instead of giving you uh, a um, presentation on, on um, PowerPoint or something like that, <clears throat> Google Slides, we want to give you a location where you can go back and it's dynamic, it's living, we're, we're constantly updating this and you can come to this site. And Don, I believe you've posted the link so that people can follow this and, and see what we're doing. And so uh, as I talk about why we're doing this, you can also see some of the re resources we have that explain this. But, um, you know, as we started to look into this over three years ago, we could really see that there were a lot of limitations to wireless. And uh, I was part of SC18 uh, in Dallas. And when we showed up to the convention center there in Dallas, there were over 600 rogue access points that were up and working. And when we got into the main part of the conference, there were over 20, 2,800 rogue access points. And this always decreases the performance of, of wireless. And so while we're not advocating that this is a replacement for wireless, we think that the time has come to be able to augment wireless. We know that we're not going to go back to a, a wired connectivity to our network, and that just wouldn't make any sense at all. In the past, we've had uh, access to EBS uh, spectrum, but we've really misused that, and we've just turned that over to the carriers and taken money for that, those of us. And some of us uh, the Utah Education and Telehealth Network back in the 90s turned that spectrum back in because we were not using it. We did that because the technology wasn't available at that time, but now the technology is available and there's a lot of interesting and fun things that are going on. So this, this whole idea that you can see here of private LTE leading into 5G is something that we think is critically important. And we have this vision of, of that. And that brings us to what CBRS has done because we wanted to do a pilot on this over three years ago. And, and what got us sidetracked immediately was this idea that we needed spectrum. So we were out there trying to, to get the FCC to allow us to get a waiver on some EBS spectrum. And along came CBRS and, and there is a CBRS Alliance. This bandwidth is in the 3.55 to 3.7 gigahertz. It's band 48. It's, uh, it's, there, there's really a lot of great things happening in, in this area. There's 150 megahertz of, of capacity in that bandwidth. And there's 70 of that that's uh, for private access licenses. This is called the innovative or innovation spectrum by the FCC. They're trying something new with, with shared spectrum so that, that even if you have a, a private access license, you don't have any spectrum that's, that's dedicated to you. But the other thing that's really interesting about this is that there are 80 megahertz of general availability spectrum that anybody can use. And <clears throat> so uh, this is very interesting. Another thing that happens is that there are many uh, handsets and other 
you know, there are native chipsets starting last fall in 2019 that are now being made with CBRS chipsets. And there are lots of different uh, access points and U U uh, uh, USB connectivity that, that can be used uh, to connect existing phones. And so there's a lot of interesting things going on in this space. Why is it interesting? Well, it, it really is interesting because for uh, lower cost, you can put in some radios that are comparable to what, what a, a Wi-Fi or a, you know, a current Wi-Fi commercial radio is costing. And, and you can get about uh, four times the, the space inside of a building as one radio will cover with that. But it'll also go up to 800, even these low end, low power uh, radios for the outside can cover up to 800 meters outside of a building. And there are other radios that are more expensive, but they will cover farther. And, and we think we've heard, and, and we want to uh, experiment with this, but uh, up to uh, two miles, maybe out to even uh, 10 miles with one CBRS radio. And so there, the cost of this is, is quite low and yet it's very complimentary. We did a, a, pre, a, a demonstration last year at SC19 in Denver, where we could show that this, uh, we, with, with three radios, we covered the entire convention floor. So it was very, far fewer. We were uh, probably over a hundred radios with Wi-Fi on the convention floor with, with, with the Wi-Fi. So it, it just, there's just so many interesting things and it doesn't interfere with Wi-Fi. It really is complementary to that technology. And, and we have many vendors that are working on this. And so there's a thing, it's the brains of this that used to cost in the millions of dollars. But now we could put one of these in for a modest investment. It's still a lot, but we could put one of these in for a modest investment of under $250,000 to start out with. And we think our six year investment to even go to 20,000 users would be under $700,000 for, for a five-year total investment in that area. It doesn't include the handsets and it doesn't include the radios, but it does include all of the brain power to, to run all of that. And so we're, we're pretty excited about what the costs are with this and what the coverage options are so that, you know, our vision is that we can go to these libraries and, and uh, our our other education sites and provide a much broader footprint and more reliability in and have so that it becomes a much better experience, even better than Wi-Fi. The, the level of throughput per user goes up above what Wi-Fi is right now. Uh, it's a it's shared and guarded spectrum so that, that you're not gonna have quite the interference. It should be that, that the data sessions and other things that you're doing, the live streaming, should be a lot more stable and a lot more enjoyable for the users to be able to do to do that. <clears throat> and uh, Corey, you want to jump in here and anywhere? And I didn't see where we started, but I, we'll try and wrap up here in another five minutes or so. And with questions, Don, I think we can do that. But if you want to just show some of the resources that we have in the map while I'm talking, uh, Corey, absolutely. Uh, we have 25 sites, so we've been fortunate in getting CARES funding. And what when we all is said and done, we'll probably have close to a million dollars worth of CARES funding and over a million dollars of total investment because some of our LEAs and others are jumping in and adding to the basic investment that we're doing. But we've also brought uh, 25 sites into this and three of those are libraries. And we're pretty excited about those libraries that, uh, that we're working with. And Corey's worked directly with those libraries. And I'd like him to take just a couple of minutes and talk about specifics that are going on within those libraries. Thanks, Jim, absolutely. So one of the libraries that I wanted to showcase here is the Twilla Library, Twilla City Library. Um, it's a, you know, Twilla is kind of a, a suburb of, of the Salt Lake Valley that's out west. And um, it's a place that's really growing and the Twilla Library has been very innovative. They've looked at all kinds of different solutions. But when we rolled this out back in July, we got CARES funding for this. And um, Jim brought me in with uh, Jeff and said, hey, we've got, to, we've got money here. We, we need to roll this out. We've got six months to get it done. So we reached out to folks that have been interested in this and Twila in, uh, Library had been interested um, at one time. And so we, we connected with them. They said, absolutely, we have an amazing use case for this type of a technology. 
Tooele uh, Library is, is kind of unique in that they've got three city parks that are located very close proximity to where the uh, where the library building is. And what they wanted to do is create a an open library branch in these three these three city libraries. So we've um, we've stood up a, a a ruckus CBRS radio on their library. Um, building, it's it's just right on on top of the building, and it sends out a signal to these these three these three parks, um, and in these three parks, we're actually just in the process of installing these receiving devices in the park. The the, the ruckus radio, the CBRS radio, has been installed on on the library itself, but um, in the parks, are just now starting to go through this process. But these receiving units have Wi-Fi connected to them. So anybody that's in that city park that has a Wi-Fi device, a phone or a Chromebook or whatever type of device they have, everybody has devices, everybody has devices that has Wi-Fi, will connect to these receiving units. So the Wi-Fi signal connects to the, and it's just a standard, you know, five gigahertz um, Wi-Fi signal. It connects to the receiving unit. The receiving unit um, takes that Wi-Fi signal, converts it to uh, CBRS, and sends it back to the radio in the library. And um, that, that signal goes all the way out to the internet. They have resources in the library they can get to. They also have internet access resources there, um, which is actually you know, very helpful. And one of the things that she was, uh, the, the, the library director, uh, Jamie there, was really concerned about is this one of the libraries is just right across the street. Um, one of these parks is right across the street from from the library, but it's a very very busy street, and they don't like to have a lot of the kids and other people crossing the street to go to the library. So they said that if we can get that signal over to that particular park, that would sure benefit those people and have that open campus, have that open library, or they can have experiences in the park, connecting to the resources that are in the library. Very cool scenario. What we're finding out is these CBRS radios that we're installing, they don't go a long ways. The ones we're doing right now. Um, we have some other ones that we're looking at that can even go miles, but this, these radios are going, you know, maybe maybe a half a mile at the very most. So they have, the parks had to be in close proximity, but it still allowed that to happen in this particular scenario. Very, very cool solution. Um, they were very adamant that's how they wanted to do it. Uh, we met with them, Jim's met with them, and we talked through this and kind of built a, a scenario that worked out really well. Um, I can share my screen really quick. I'm going to just share another picture here really quick just to show you what it looks like, the radio on top of the building, and then we'll um, turn the time over. I think we'll be out of time. So give me just a second. I'll grab this. Um, I think you guys can all see that now. Is that right? Jim, can you see that radio on top of that building? Yep, yep we can see it. Yeah. So they're they're small radios. They're, they're they're not huge like you know like the regular LTE type services. You can put it on there, on the cable down in, connects to the network, and all's a go. So it gives you a good idea. Any any thoughts or questions on on that particular use case, or maybe we're waiting for questions later. Is that right, Don? No, so, we can do so now. I have, I have a, a yeah, ton of them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anybody, all right. Uh, anybody have a question? Please uh, drop it into the chat. Um, that uh, base station antenna is that is that sectional? Does that cover uh, uh, a certain that, degree of coverage? A, this this is actually omnidirectional. That particular one, it's a built-in antenna. Mm -hmm. It's omnidirectional. It covers the 360. That's why it only goes out about a half a mile. It's not. Yeah, it's the Ruckus Q910, and it, it propagates 360 degrees. So it doesn't go very far, but it goes in every direction, which is pretty uh, cool. Okay, great. And then the the client radios are directional, aim back at the. Yep. The yep. Yeah, the receiving yeah, so, unit. To, go ahead. Yeah, Jim. just to put a little finer point on what Corey's saying. So so that's on the library and it's radiating out that 360 degrees. And there's a park across the street there that that we're going to put another receiver that will receive and send the CBRS radio signals. But then uh, we'll have Wi-Fi in the park that that can be used. It's just traditional Wi-Fi that's going to connect to that radio that is in the park. And right. send that back to the, the library. So, so it's Wi-Fi, but it's but it's linked directly to the library. Sure, the Wi-Fi is a universal connector, and yeah. the CRS right. is, the, is the thing that'll get the distance and penetrate through some obstructions as well. Uh, we're that, Don. 
we're, uh, we're familiar with this scenario. We've been doing these with TV white space for the past several years. Uh, it's a different, uh, different frequency, but it's the same principle of supporting these remote client stations around the community so that the library can set up what we've been calling uh, uh, public access stations, trying to come up with a terminology of, for these units that are different from just, just a, a sitting access point. Uh, but the, does the library intend to run that as, as just an open access point, or would you log on to the library as though you were, you know, inside of the building using uh, 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 just their Wi-Fi? We've you really know, left that up to, to each one of the, you know, so, so we're seeding these libraries and others with this capability, and we're trying to learn all of this. So mm -hmm. what I would say there is that, you know, there's a lot of talk about CBRS. There's a lot of chatter going on right now. Everybody's really interested in this. We have the theory that we really need to get experience. We need to spend less time talking about it, more time doing. And so Corey can show a map of, of going green of, of what we have installed already. And so we're getting this installed. That's And, and we're more excited about working on that and getting it installed and starting to get some of the experience with these use cases there's, you know, there's a lot more for us to do. We've learned a lot. We've started to share on a national level. I'm part of the, the Internet to Future Wireless Group and also the Quilt uh, 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 Private LTE Group and the CBRS Alliance. So we continue to, to work in this area. The last thing I'd like to plug in, then we can answer questions. Well, is, and, and that's really important because we want to tie Edgerum to this. That's the answer to right. John's question. I just want to go to Edgerum. So... So we're working with MD Wren and Merritt from uh, Maryland and Michigan and Utah, and we're gonna do a proof of concept that shows how we can transparently go from e one private network to the other. So we're thinking of that as, you know, that's just private access for all those networks to be transparent. And then we will work together on a national level with all the other Wrens that are interested in, they're gonna start to do this and anybody else really who wants to do this so that we'll have uh, just seamless authentication through each one of those. And then what we'd like to do is work with Internet2, Jayant, and others to, to really tie that to Edgerome because we use Edgerome for access and we look at Edgerome as uh, infrastructure for us because it gives those who have Edgerome accounts immediate access to wherever they go. And I've been with board members in the Smithsonian. I've been to Trinity College Trinity University in Dublin, uh, to St. Andrews, to many places in Europe. And it's just wonderful to be able to walk in and have immediate authentication. We want to make sure that we have that, kind, that same type of authentication with the LTE networks. We believe it's possible. We're working on some proofs of concept that we can show off to others and, and really do something that standardizes that across the board. And then we are working with, there are these commercial carriers that are not traditionally uh, wireless carriers, but they have gotten PAL access license or pro the private access licenses, the PAL licenses for CBRS. They're putting in radios, they're making major commitments to that in our state. And we were talking with them and they're all of them willing to work with us on some sort of a private roaming so that there won't be a settlement, but there will be access to those so that we, we expand the footprint of this network and and really partner with commercial providers and others to make this available so that it's not just in close proximity to our buildings, which is where we're focused, but but can move beyond that also. Very, very cool. Uh, this well, is an exciting project. Uh, Corey, were you trying to say something there? Just one other point, just to make sure. So we are really interested in putting edge around because it's just regular Wi-Fi that these people are connecting to our students and whoever's going to connect to these libraries, just regular the Wi-Fi, we're putting Edgerum on that Wi-Fi wi -Fi part of that and being able to tie that back to the Wi-Fi server or the uh, Edgerum service as well. So I know Jim talked about that and covered that, but that's, that, that's what the plan is, is in these libraries and all these schools that Edgerum, where Wi-Fi, where they're converting the Wi-Fi to CBRS, they will be putting in uh, Edgerum. So anyway, thanks, well, Jim. And, and so, yeah. you know, they're... Uh, you got, this is just really great to, to take advantage of CBRS. And I know that for some of our participants here, 
uh, a lot of this is is just a running alphabet soup of uh, telecom acronyms. <laughs> But uh, sorry about we've, that. We've, no, we have we've gone through these and we've looked at EBS and CBRS and TV white space and so forth. So I think we've got a context for that. I'm going to drag you into uh, explaining uh, the, the various uh, yeah. technology speeds. You touched that already. Uh, but well, it's what I can uh, tell you, Don, really quick, Don, there's a lot of resources on this website. How to guides. We've got definitions. We've got user group information, just a ton of information on this website. So you can go and, and get up to speed on any of this stuff. This is great. I'm putting together a glossary so that that'll. I'm going to get that posted so for our yeah. board and others to have that too. We, we've got a, a a list of presentations that we've had over the last few months delving into each of these technologies. Not as much on on CBRS as as you've given us today, which is terrific. We'll be adding that to the repository of presentations on how these are are being used by libraries and other anchor institutions. So, um, well, just one point, we're, we've been advocating that libraries, if they're in the position to, in most of our cases with TV white space, it's the library itself that's deploying these networks. So it's in, technically it's an in-house network. In your situation, you're providing this as a service on top of the, uh, the, the backhaul service to the, to the library. You're dividing, providing it through the library out to these library outlets, we can call them. Uh, they should be considered official library sites. And in our view, they should be uh, eligible under E-rate, but that's uh, a future discussion. Uh, but uh, the question of, uh, uh, of interface where the, the user sees the library, you know, the library, libraries have all kinds of uh, logon uh, <clears throat> portals and things or, yeah, yeah logons and and but we see it as an opportunity for the library to to show its services you know where would you like to go the internet sure or, or would you like to look at our digital services our books our databases we would like to talk, talk to a librarian not to just run it as a, as a straight open access point it's just a recommendation we make but that said what uh, let's, get the, let's, get, let's get to the cost uh, projections on this uh, that system you just gave it's uh, it's an interesting and, and a kind of a typical situation, I think, for most libraries to deploy, you know, a handful of uh, these uh, access points around. What would that system cost? That would be, I guess, a service. So how are you pricing it or anticipating pricing it? So do you want me to jump well, in on this, one, Jim? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So let me, let me talk to you just a little bit. So, so that ruckus radio that we showed that was on that ceiling or on that roof, it's about, you know, just over $2,000. And then these receiving units that go out to the park, it's just over $200. But that's just the beginning of the cost. There's lots of other things that have to be put in, uh, what's called a local drop-off box. You have to actually put a piece of equipment into the library that allows the traffic to stay local there when it needs to. And that's, you know, we're looking at with a five-year contract on that. It's actually software you purchase, but then with a the five-year contract, you're looking at about $4,500 for that. And then, Jim, you can talk a lot about the EPC core and the SIMs and different things if you want to jump in. Yeah, if, if we look at what the cost of the EPC core is done per subscriber over a five-year period of time, we're looking at about $15 total cost. And so, uh, you know, just, just that's the EPC core. If you went and, and went to an Athenet or one of the cloud core providers, you're probably going to pay about $10 per radio per month, or not per radio, per user per month. To, to do something like that. So you can see that the difference in cost uh, just, just in the private LTE space between running your own core and, and providing that for the users versus going out and paying a monthly subscription fee, that, that there's a lot of cost advantages to running our own core. And that's, you know, that, and that's given that we have the core already in place, that's the incremental cost to add 2,000 users, about $30,000. So there, there's your $15 for for the one-time subscription cost and the five years of, of maintenance to keep that current. And so we just see that, that uh, you know, we don't have, we don't anticipate even uh, providing it as a service that we're gonna be providing, you know, charging some monthly rate. Uh, we, we look at this as we're probably gonna figure out as we have done in the past with our users uh, that, um, that we can, um, get a base funding from the state and then do something, maybe a, a yearly allocation. It doesn't have to be a whole lot, but it's gonna be far less than if they, they did a, a private LTE subscription or a commercial subscription at $20 a month. Uh, you know, I'm, I've just been such, and I will continue to be an advocate to say, the carriers providing MiFi's don't cut it. It's too expensive for what you get. 
if we can go this route and private LTE and, and keep it close to our buildings, we're going to drive the cost way down. We're going to drive, you know, we're seeing throughput of over 100 megabits per second on CBRS radios. We're seeing upwards of 150 megabits per second. We think that as the technology grows, that we're going to see better throughput than that. We, you know, when you go into the EPC core, there's all these things that limit bandwidth that you can click, you know, limit their throughput, limit, you know, do all these different things. We don't have to do any of those limitations that we see that even if it says it's, it's um, unlimited data with a carrier, we know that that's just not the case. Okay. So we just believe that this is going to be a much better way to, to for our users to really be able to, to access the internet wirelessly. I'm I'm with you, Jim, and and you know the Rens have long made the points that that their services are are not totally comparable to commodity internet. There's a whole batch of layer of services, security, performance, reliability that that go into that, uh, and and it's really too much for us today. But uh, you were your <laughs> the monthly rate you were describing is for that. For that remote station, each station, at uh, no, that would be at all the end user uh, amounts. Okay, there. so then the library each... has has a ton of patrons, and they all can come up and you know, they're a library member or they're a guest or whatever the library says. So, but it, you know, they may they may have like I said, eighty eight million people access the internet at a library. So that's a bunch. Right. Uh, so everybody's got Wi-Fi and, and, and we yeah. can use Wi-Fi to broadcast and, and get back to the CBRS. But in the future, I think we're going to be able to have a SIM card that's dedicated to the library so that th that patron could put in a second SIM card or an eSIM. Yeah. Uh, you know, eSIM, there's five or six I've heard, uh, and I, I can't prove this out, but I'm going to, uh, uh, profiles that you could put on a phone so you could have one of those be the library profile whenever you're uh, go into the library, you just select that profile and go directly in and authenticate to them. And, and that's what we think is going to happen. Okay, that's, that's, that's good. I, this is really going to be, we're watching this. We've been, we've been following you guys for a long time, and this is exciting developments. Uh, congratulations on the progress you've made. Um, well, I'm sure we're going to come back to this in a future date and see we how We need to get to Catherine. We need to hear from her. I'm really excited to hear what she has right to say. Doing and, and Don, you, you have my email address. Anybody yeah. can reach out to me and we can get them some more details. Uh, you okay. know, probably the best thing to do is reach out to me and then I can schedule time with Jim and Jeff and anybody else. So if you want to drop that into the chat, then people can contact yeah. you or, or they can go through yeah. me. Uh, we're certainly you. available to answer questions and we want to be helpful and we want to expand this community and, and these services as, as quickly as we can. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, over to Catherine. So now we're gonna, we're gonna step back. This, we've just heard a, you know, a powerful front end story here on uh, an interface with end users and actual customers, I guess, or members uh, that the libraries are. But behind the RENs, uh, there are large networks, backbone networks that they rely on. And uh, one of these, or one of the very few, is, uh, is Gayant. Gayant? I'm sorry if I've got that wrong, Catherine. It's not a gay aunt, no. Uh, it's a Gayant. <laughs> Gayant, oui, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, the, the RINs depend upon Gayant and in the US internet too, I guess you would say. And, and so uh, Catherine's going to give us the the you know behind the behind scenes so uh yeah. Catherine, thank you welcome uh thanks for staying a little bit late in the afternoon wherever you oh, are that's fine that's fine so uh well thank you very much don and uh hello to you all um yeah my name is katrin stuber um i am cco in jayant and jayant is the pan-european research and education network network jayant in that respect as uh, don already said is a network of networks. We interconnect the European national research and education networks, and we have a global re reach of dedicated capacity to over 110 research and education networks in the world. So I'm very happy to have the opportunity today to talk a bit about how NRENs interconnect research and education institutions around the world. I've been myself uh, with the European Research and Education Network, uh, Jeant and formerly Dante, uh, for over 23 years. Um, and I've always been part of the team that extends our global reach. So I've been working in Latin America, 
I've been working in Asia and in, in all regions of Africa. And for a very long time, I also had very intense conversations with Internet2 uh, in, uh, in the late 90s when Internet2 was first formed and uh, we were agreeing how we would interconnect. So I've been there for a long time. Um, otherwise, a little bit about myself. Uh, I am German. Uh, I'm married to a Spanish man. We live in the Netherlands. We speak English. Um, so it's a completely European story. Um, and uh, I'm always glad that I work also for so, a really, truly European organization like, like Sheant. So um, why are we doing all this? Um, you see here, uh, you know, nice European centric, forgive me for that. I understand there's a lot of Americans, uh, but this is a European centric map. Um, and that is really the map that shows our global connectivity from Europe into the world. And if you would put the Internet 2 into the center of it, it would be similar, a little different. Um, but I mean, one of the things that we really understand is that humanity as such is facing issues and we collectively uh, are being challenged um, at this point in time. We have shortages of all sorts. We face climate changes. Uh, we have, as of recently, pandemics. And we need to find global solutions to a lot of questions. And um, that means that we need to bring together the creativity, brain power, equipment, and facilities from every corner of the world. And that requires that researchers, academics, students, librarians worldwide are able to cooperate and build fast on each other's ideas and results. And of course, also to ensure that that doesn't only happen today, but also tomorrow, we need every child in the world to have access to education, access to learning resources, and we need our kids to have digital skills wherever they sit. And um, so Jean, this is basically the mission and the vision of Jean. Um, and uh, we therefore, as an organization, we procure national, regional, intercontinental capacity in the telecommunications market. We buy capacity, we build dedicated data communications networks for universities and research institutions, and then we run and operate these. And uh, in our reach is quite uh, significant. In, in Europe, we estimate that uh, we interconnect about 50 million users. And um, I have to say that for everything that I'm presenting here today, uh, we've received very generous support from the European Union over the last 25 years. And um, we are also at this point in time very active in the COVID-19 activities, um, specifically the European COVID-19 research platform, which is of course a pilot platform for the bigger European Open Science Cloud, which will look at interdisciplinary research. And um, Geant is um, founding partner of the European Open Science Cloud, but that is a completely different story. We've heard Eduron before. Um, my colleague, Klaas Virenga, is uh, seen as the father of Eduron. I'm always happy to sit next to him when we go to the office, which we don't do at the moment. But Eduron has been uh, an enormous success. And uh, Jim has just been saying that, you know, he could uh, open his laptop in Dublin and he could open his laptop anywhere. And it's quite astonishing. I mean, these days you can open your, your laptop in, uh, in Zambia or in Uganda or in Kenya and, um, you know, equally in Bhutan, in, um, in Indonesia, and you will be online. Um, and uh, the beauty here is, of course, that authentication always happens at your home institution. Your, wherever you connect to EduRome, your authentication is at your home institution and the institution that connects you has a trust system which makes them trust that your authentication is good because you come with an EduRome credential. So this is really um, not only access, but it is secure access. And uh, we believe that this is extremely important and one of the, the values also that we have as Sheant. We don't only want to provide access for our um, scientists, researchers, students, academics, and faculty. We want to make sure that this is secure access. Um, so unlike most Wi-Fi services, passwords are never shared with the locations and uh, we ensure this way end-to-end -end privacy for users. And as you can see, um, you know, 
this at your row map very much um, maps onto the map that I showed you earlier about the connected NRANs because it is a service that is one of the first services that NRANs normally make available to their institutions apart from the normal IP connectivity. But it even is a service that very often is made available before even an NREN exists, because for, for EduRoam, you only really need to have um, the access point in the institution. And EduRoam has tremendous reach. Uh, there are tens of thousands of EduRoam hotspots around the world. In 2019, we had 4.5 billion authentications worldwide. So that's, uh, that's an incredible number. And uh, that makes us one of the biggest um, operators uh, worldwide. And COVID-19 has, of course, triggered many EduRoam providers to consider what we call EduRoam everywhere. So, um, you know, a lot of EduRoam providers are asking themselves the questions, how they can bring EduRoam outside of the building into uh, you know, outside of the walls of the university or library buildings. And we hear about all sorts of plans. I mean, we've always had, um, you know, some countries, some cities where, you know, the buses had EduRoam or the city centers had EduRoam or the parks, you know, open park spaces had EduRoam. But what we see today is that this is becoming increasingly a service that NRENs uh, are seriously looking into together with their institutions. And um, yeah, so EduRoam will become more and more available in public places, in car parks, in parks in general, so that to ensure that students and faculty have access in times of inaccessible buildings and closed universities. And we will believe that this is very important. Um, there are two more services that I would like to um, make sure that you are aware of. Um, Specifically during the pandemic, uh, EduVPN, um, sort of sister brother service to EduRoam, has become very important because there are still many today that at this point in time cannot use EduRoam. I haven't been locked in to EduRoam for a while. I'm not traveling. I'm not going to the office here in my home. Institute, in my home, of course, I'm using the uh, private Wi-Fi um, installed in my house. Um, so you know, we really need to look into how do we make sure that these unprotected wireless connections that we're all using at this point in time become secure. So VPN, of course, is a secure and encrypted internet connection. And uh, EduVPN is a, is a service, again, uh, from the um, NREN community to ensure that it uh, really um, is uh, the, um, a, a private network across a public network and enables users to send and receive data across shared or public networks as if their computing devices were directly connected to the private network. And again, this is a, you know, a secure way of making sure that uh, users can access their institutions and are not completely dependent on their unprotected home, home wireless setups. Another service that we see um, is very important is the Open Up to You educational platform, which we have been making available since the 25th of March. So very quickly made it available to schools and universities across Europe who want to use it. This is a, a, a platform again available through participating NRENs. It uses EduMeet as a VC tool, and it is particularly attractive to um, institutions um, in environments in countries where you know resources are scarce, where you know Zoom is unaffordable. So we've seen a lot of uptake, particularly of um, of EduMeet, also in uh, in some of the African countries where you know uh, this has become a very very important tool. So everything uh, trying to really ensure that you know. Um, uh, learning continues and, and education can continue at a time when, because of the pandemic, a lot of the normal ways we are dealing with this is interrupted. And while maybe in Europe and in the US, um, our systems and our home working wireless and the fact that everybody has a computer or an iPad, you know, makes this home learning possible for most in general. Uh, for many other regions in the world, of course, this is in general not available. So uh, we need to really make sure that uh, we do what we can. 
And um, this brings me to um, my next slide. And um, I mean, Don, from now on, you can probably stop me whenever, because what I will do now is I will highlight just a little bit um, around the world where we are and what's going on. Um, I'll start here with uh, the African case, because I've seen that um, a lot of people are, tend to be really interested in what is happening in, in the African environment. Um, as Jean, we've been active in Africa since uh, about 2006. We first ran a feasibility study as always. And then from 2011 onwards, we received development aid funding to build jayant like infrastructures in three African clusters, uh, the Southeast of Africa, Western Central Africa and uh, North. Um, uh, so North of the, of the Sahara Africa. Um, so we have three partners in the, in the African continent, the Ubuntu Net Alliance, Wacron and Ezrin. They are similar sort of geant like organizations. And uh, as you can see um, on the map here, we have uh, quite a lot of countries now connected uh, in the African continent, which means that um, in these countries, we really do uh, create level playing fields between African researchers, African scientists and the rest of the world which I think is very, very important uh, for, for global science and um, innovation in general. Um, so I think this is one of our very successful projects. And as you are a library organization, I wanted to make you aware of Lipsense. Um, Lipsense is an initiative, which is an African initiative across the entire continent, but it is run by the Western, Af by the Western Central African uh, uh, network, WACRAN. And Lipsense was launched in 2016 to bring together the research and education networks and the academic library communities in order to strengthen open access and open science in Africa. Because one of the things that we absolutely recognize is that while um, libraries, of course, play an important role in any university setup, they play a particularly important role in the African setup because that is the the, where a lot of the information is gathered and a lot of the access to say computers is still provided in, in many African institutions. So it was very important to the African entrants to have a very strong relationship with libraries. So Lipsense is a coherent African library and rent collaboration. They're working on policies, infrastructure, capacity building topics across the three major language groups. So it's an activity that runs in English, French, and Arabic. And uh, they have uh, created quite a lot of concrete outcome. And I've attended uh, a few of the meetings with uh, librarians in, uh, in the African continent. And it's, it's been very interesting to see um, uh, the work here. And of course, it is all in relation to um, open science and open data. But um, I think this is, um, I, I would be very happy if, you know, by my presentation here, we could uh, see that, you know, the, the IFLA consortium and Lipsense could um, start working together. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe this is an invitation to, to some of you to, you know, to invite them into the, in, in the future and vice versa. Um, yeah, and so the rest of it is really an overview and I'll show you the maps here. Uh, of what we do in other world regions. So North Africa has specific links, of course, to Europe because it's part of the European Neighborhood Program of the European Commission. So we make sure that North African countries are directly connected to, um, to Géant. Uh, even though the Arab Spring has been quite a while now, uh, we have, um, you know, not too many North African countries uh, connected here. And of course, uh, you know, also the, um, uh, you know, the, there is potential in the future to include also Syria and Iraq and interested Gulf states on a non-beneficiary basis into these projects, but we really need to see how this uh, develops uh, in the region. Otherwise, in the Middle East, um, you know, what you would call the more affluent countries in the Middle East all have NRENs and um, are connected uh, to us. So we have Qatar, Iran, Oman, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE is connected to, to the Jean network and onwards, all of this is onwards to um, Internet 2. 
In Asia Pacific, we run probably together with the Tain Star CC Cooperation Center based in Korea, we're probably running the biggest network. Um, we're estimating that this is about 55 million users well, um, in Southeast Asia. And um, yeah, this is, this is a very, very big network covering um, all of the uh, Asian Pacific and uh, Southeast Asian countries. Obviously, there's a huge interest from a research and educational point of view from Europe to China. We have specific links with China. We have a cost share based on reciprocity with the Chinese. Equally, we have connectivity to India and uh, South Korea. And of course, also um, to Japan. So uh, that region of the world is very well covered, also because the um, more affluent countries in that region are actively supporting those that don't have so much money. Mm -hmm. And uh, clearly also this is, um, this is a region of the world where the United States have a lot of interest and we're working very closely here with Pacific Wave, um, but also um, of course the university in Hawaii. Um, Eastern Partnership, those are the countries closest to our Russian neighbors. Uh, they receive uh, very generous funding from the European Union uh, for very geopolitical reasons. And uh, here the aim is to, over the next five, 10 years, fully integrate these countries into the, uh, into the European Jean backbone. Latin America is uh, one of our earliest partners. We've been working with Latin America since 2001 three and uh, they have received um, various iterations of funding from the European Union and the latest of that is uh, an IIU funding for a cable system that directly interconnects Europe to Latin America and that is one of the few links transatlantic links of course that uh, bypasses the United States and last not least um, our collaboration with uh, with the United States. Um, it has to be at all times recognized that uh, from a scientific research traffic point of view, uh, the Internet 2 and ESnet, the energy science network in the United States are our biggest partners globally. Um, you know, the, the, so, and that is why uh, on a reciprocal basis and funded with European funding and NSF funding, we have a lot of capacity, which is transatlantic uh, between our networks um, and which is completely diverse as well. So a cable cut here cannot really um, um, do anything to the resilience. So, I mean, this completely resilient networks and uh, that really reflects, uh, of course, the importance of research and uh, scientific uh, collaborations that are ongoing between Europe and uh, the United States and also, of course, Canada. And that's my contribution for today. Thank you. That's superb, Catherine. Thank you so much. Uh, can you explain a little bit about uh, the reciprocity, the exchange agreements? I think people really don't quite understand that. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, we use the word reciprocity because we don't want to use the word cost share. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, the way it works, it really, it's, it's, it depends very much on um, who we are talking to. But what we, try, what we try to do is to have a fair um, arrangement as Europe with other world regions to ensure that, you know, we sort of come to an agreement where 50% of the cost is carried by one partner and 50% by the other partner. In the past, when, uh, you know, uh, neither the NSF nor Europe, uh, the European Union were co-funding this. We actually had arrangements where, you know, European partners and US partners put the money together and bought one link. These days, luckily, we don't need to do that anymore. These days, we have an agreement by which we say, okay, you put in a 100 gig link, and then if we need an upgrade, it's my turn to put in a 100 gig link. And then if we need another upgrade, it's again the US who puts in a uh, a 100 gig link in and then it's again the Europeans who put it in so we can sort of rely on each other to upgrade conjointly what it means of course is that we need to have very transparent relationships when it comes to procurement because we don't want everybody to procure the cheapest link because then we wouldn't have a resilience so that you know needs a bit of 
good care and uh, good understanding between the partners, but we have that. In the case with the Chinese, it's slightly different. Here we have said we procure together. So we have a procurement run procurement together with the Chinese. And then we've basically said, okay, so first year you paid, second year we pay, third year you pay, fourth year we pay. So that works differently. In the case of India, uh, they bring their connectivity to Europe, but then we allow them access to all of the network, all of the reach in, in Southeast Asia through the TAIN network, where because of some crazy funding in Europe, they wouldn't normally be a beneficiary. So it, it's, it's, it's all of it is based on very um, conversations that are going on with partners around the world based on the trust that we've established for very many years and based on the general sort of sense of purpose that what we're doing here is supporting global science and to find the best way and be as flexible as possible. Fantastic. The aim to have fairness. It only needs to be fair. That's it. Really, really interesting. Uh, an extraordinary uh, uh, level of cooperation, collaboration. On yes. That. And yes, as you say, absolutely. Trust, how is there a, a, an analogy in the commercial network world to that? Is anything no, like that? no I, 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 I honestly don't think so. I don't think that. I mean, look, you know, if you wanted to contact in Guatemala or in Bhutan, I could give you the names. And, um, you know, and I and then you would immediately have a friend there who would work with you to ensure that your user need, you know, is dealt with. And I don't think that exists anywhere in the commercial environment because I don't think any commercial, it's, it's the difference between transactional relationships and community relationships. What we have is a collaborative community spirit and the commercial world has transactional contracts and that's a completely different playing field. And yet you work in that world, you have to interact with the commercial providers, right? These are these, you don't own all these networks, right? No, no, we have, of course, we, we, um, we go out into the world and we procure all of our connectivity from commercial providers. And that is when we are extremely hard nosed. Um, you know, I don't, our procurement team is, is um, is full of uh, yeah, hard-nosed commercial people, but um, they also know what sort of organization they're working for. So, you know, we can, we can quite nicely separate that. So we have, the, we have a business sense, Jayant is clearly run with a business sense, but we are not commercially driven. And I think that is a, you know, is a different. Very much way. so. As they say, uh, just because we're nonprofit doesn't mean we don't have a bottom line. Uh, Precisely, but the... Don, if I could just if I could just add, this is Jim again. Um, yeah. We work with Internet Two very closely. Who works very closely with Jayant, and uh, we found this to be true. You know, we we are a member of Internet Two. They provide uh, wonderful services. They connect us all around the world. That uh, they're it's it just as as Catherine was saying, they're not. Uh, bottom line transactional driven they're really trying to figure out what our needs are and and in working together there's many opportunities that we've had that we would not have had with commercial providers thanks Jim. That's, thanks that's very nice yeah. nice yeah. testimony i wanted to kind of make a reference that i i think the this way of doing business has implications beyond networks that there are a lot of there are a lot of social economic challenges that we have that need innovations in business models. And I think what you, you folks are doing are, are, is really pioneering because the scale and the, and the critical nature of the services you're providing. So thank you very much. Uh, any, anyone have any questions here? We run over a little bit. We started a little bit, that's fine. Uh, we also will close the full recording here shortly, but then we kind of hang around if you have time uh, just to, you know, see if anybody has anything to say and just chat informally. Uh, any other questions coming in here? Catherine, how would a, how would a, a country, let's say an African country, a West African country start? How would they kind of get going? Would a, would a university say, uh, approach Jayant and say, we'd like to initiate a network with the national government step in? How, how would that typically go? Well, NRANs normally are grassroots 
and uh, we often see it is uh, you know heads of IT CIOs, uh, but very often in Africa actually librarians who say we need to do something about this. This is not possible that I sit in the library and I can make myself a T while some file is downloading. I need better access. And, um, and then uh, I think by now, NREN, the, the model of NRENS is quite well known. Um, so, but the way it works is that as soon as uh, anybody in the community would hear about uh, you know, this sort of talk coming out of a country, we would immediately invite them to a conference of ours, or we would actually go and meet them. And this is something that we've done very many times that um, we've actually gone with it because nobody is a, is a prophet in their own country. You always need to hear it from somebody else. And particularly in Africa, obviously, you don't want to hear it from some German person who hasn't got a clue. You need to hear it from African peers that, um, so, you know, for example, take the, ex take the example of Mali. Um, Mali has an NREN, um, and it was created because, uh, you know, somebody from Zambia, from the Zambian NREN, gave support, and then um, it is being set up, and then very often what happens is that, of course, um, in many places around the world, this is not only in Africa, uh, the engineering knowledge is missing, and then we have our friends from the NSRC uh, at the University of Oregon, the Network Startup Resource Center, Steve Uter, um, you will probably know him. No. And they come and they give direct engineering assistance and they train the trainers. So they train a subset of people and then it just becomes bigger and bigger. And then at one stage, you need to have um, the interaction with the government. And that is where often the European Union then opens doors for us because they, they have presence in, in many countries around the world. And they will open the, the door to us to ministries. But that is when the real work starts because quite honestly, a lot of uh, politicians thinks that the internet is solved. They often live in parts of cities where internet is really easily accessible. And the fact that you know some universities have minimal connectivity in, in many countries in the world, they don't really know that and they don't really worry about that too much. So this is when the work really starts. But We've gone through this so many times now, many, many times in Europe, in the beginning, um, in, in Latin America, in Asia, in Africa. I know exactly by now what will be set at what stage and what needs to be my answer. And, you know, it goes on and on. Wow. Um, you you mentioned, was it LibSense, I think? The, LibSense, the, yeah. 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 I, I, I'm sure I can speak on behalf of IFLA and Stephen and be, accept the invitation to uh, engage with them. Absolutely. And your point about the libraries driving the, the need to have exchange and, and the shared resources, you know, the large body of, of materials that, that they depend upon, uh, especially, I suppose, as university libraries, where would the public libraries, do the, do the university, li we've started to see some of this, the public libraries partnering with the university libraries uh, to uh, foster connectivity projects. Is, is that, do you see that or, or experience any of that? Um, well, certainly in Europe, um, I think in, in, in the African environment, what we see mainly is university libraries though. Um, and, uh, but here, I mean, uh, there's many NRENs that actually go back really to librarians taking the decision that something needs to change. And uh, I find that very interesting because it is, um, uh, what I have seen in, in many, many um, environments is that if a librarian takes a decision that this needs to be happening now, that the library, the university needs to get better connectivity. If the decision comes from the librarian, it often works. Uh, if the decision comes from somewhere else within the university environment, it becomes more complicated. So I always encourage librarians to actually be active in this. They uh, seem to have a good way of, uh, of dealing with the problems. I think they're maybe less political than, than other parts of, uh, of, a, of an institution. And we've seen this uh, interesting uh, uh, across the, the, the so-called educational institutions, our schools, our universities, our colleges, our public libraries. We found two populations that can have these kind of open conversations. 
the network administrators, they all shared complaints about lame users and librarians who, whatever their speciality, have a common frame of reference and can sit, can sit down together and immediately have a conversation about uh, how to collaborate, share services and support because a lot of their, their populations overlap. I mean, geographically overlap. And, mm -hmm. and we think there's a lot of opportunity yet for those kinds of collaborations to increase. One is as you're doing building these networks and then uh, the service layer. Uh, a famous historian in the US said that uh, uh, a university is nothing but a library surrounded by some buildings. <laughs> And there's a point to that. I don't know, maybe it's a little strong, but uh, we think librarians really hold the key to uh, collaboration and collaboration is the key to solutions. It's just too complicated to not. Uh, though, uh, though trust is, is still the element that, that's required to do any kind, of, uh, any kind of relationship successfully over time. So we have gone over a bit here, and I think this would be a good uh, point to, uh, to uh, close the recording. But before we do, I'd like to ask everyone to unmute, if you would. Unmute everyone, please. Unmute for a second here. Everyone, we'd like to uh, give our speakers uh, a round of applause, and thank you very much. <laughs>